Hello, I'm Anthony. Welcome to the Core Game 1 tutorial series. Today we're going to have a look at a couple of sections of the synthesizer. We're going to figure out how the oscillator and amplifier sections work. Hope you enjoy this one today. Check out the Patreon and channel member links below. It's an awesome way to support my channel and allow me to carry on making these videos. Okay, let's make a start. We're dealing in programs today, I'm not worrying about combis, multi-sounds. That's far too complicated. We want to figure out how the synthesizer fundamentally makes sound. And so we want to concentrate on a single program. Now it's perfectly reasonable to load your own program. You could choose one of these sounds and that's going to do the job absolutely fine. But to keep things absolutely as simple as possible, I'm going to initialize the synthesizer to a default state. We do that on the left hand side with this little drop down arrow and we select initialize. Now every option in the program has been set to its simplest possible state. So we start off in piano. You can see there's a single piano oscillator here. And that's what a piano oscillator sounds like. Now, because we're going to be playing with this sound quite a lot today, I'm actually gonna choose something a little bit more pleasant. I'm gonna head into the browser and I'm gonna choose card one, preset five, the organ. If I double click organ one, that's gonna be the default sound that I'm gonna use for most of today. Okay, so we have a single oscillator here. It's polyphonic, as you just heard. I can play multiple notes. If I switch to mono, now I can't. Play an chord, but I'm only hearing one note. Mono mode on the core game one is last note priority. So when I play those three notes of the C major chord, it's always the last note that's played. Same coming down as well. Let's switch back to poly mode and we can play chords again. Now you've already seen me change the oscillator sound, but we'll have a bit more of a closer look at exactly what's going on here. We have tabs across the top of the oscillator picker. If you switch to search, you can basically filter by different sound types. So here you can see all of the organ options and it's spread across all of the cards. If we switch over to card picker explicitly, now we're looking at all of the oscillator presets for memory card number one. And if we scroll across, you can see that memory card number one contains a hundred different oscillator presets. Now that number's not consistent, it's entirely dependent on the specific memory card. Card number two, for instance, has just got 90 oscillator presets. This has got nothing to do with the 50 basic programs that you can save. So a program can contain up to two different oscillators. Here we're just looking at a single oscillator kind of component, the core component of the program, and we can have two of those. Now it only makes sense to mess with the oscillator level if you engage double oscillator mode, because in single mode, you've got plenty of other places from which you can control the volume. Just leave your level at 99, there's no reason not to. But when you're in double mode, you are actually mixing two different sounds together. And in this case, you might want oscillator two to be louder than one, so perfectly reasonable to start editing it at that point. And these octave settings give us a, an option to increase or decrease the pitch of the bass sound of the oscillator by one octave. So there's my central eight foot setting at 130 hertz and four foot's gonna be 261-ish. There we go, 261 hertz. Very straightforward so far. The next section down is a little bit idiosyncratic. This is the pitch envelope generator. Now you'll see it's actually grayed out and you can't do anything about this. It, that's just the way it looks. EG stands for envelope generator and you'll see EG and MG modulation generator in lots of different places in the synthesizer. Korg absolutely love their acronyms. So this entire section at the bottom of the oscillator is all about pitch envelope generation. And this basically means modulating the pitch. Every time we press a key, we're gonna fundamentally modulate or change the pitch of the oscillator for every note. Let's deal with the envelope generator itself to start with. It's very unintuitive when you first look at it that there are more than one component to it. Can you see that the two attack options basically obscure each other? So this is our start level. Every time we press a key, what's the pitch going to be at? So everything I'm talking about here is pitch. Very easy to demonstrate if I mess with the envelope at all and play a note. So you heard the note start off, I'm playing a C here, and I'm, when I first hit that note, I'm somewhere down on E. These levels, they're all numerical offsets, so you're gonna to have to work out empirically what this is actually giving you. 
So we're starting off below the natural pitch of the note that I'm playing. Then I'm coming up to a point above the pitch. So if our pitch line is this horizontal line in the middle of this mini graph, I'm going to go above C. Got up to about F there. And then I come down to this stage over here. This is the decay time. So how long do we take to get down to the, the core played note? Can't do anything about the level out position. It's always going to come down to the actually played key. So this is effectively an attack, decay, release envelope. There's no sustain level in this envelope, which basically means after we've gone through all of the interesting stuff, we're going to end out playing the note that we've actually hit, which kind of makes sense. We do interestingly have a release level. So I can drag this release level and go down. Now, as things stand at the moment, you're not going to hear the change that I've just made because this note fundamentally has no release. That's why this is a dual conversation today. We need to talk about the amplifier as well. I need to make this note last after I release the key, which at the moment, I'm going to let it settle down to a C and then let it go. And it just stops immediately. Let's jump over to the amplifier page at this time. I want to introduce some release into this sound. I want to make it last longer after I let the key go. Here's my release time, and I'm just going to drag that out. And now we're going to have a release cycle on this note. So there's me going up. There's me coming back down. So that's all pitch envelope generation. And then let the key go. The sound faded away, but as it faded away, it also dropped in pitch. It's not immediately obvious what these um, velocity sensitivity controls. Can you see the, the dark label? What they're actually doing envelope generator intensity is referring in fact both of these controls are referring to the pitch envelope generator so if i increase envelope intensity now if i play a key very lightly we got up to about d just about d in the tuner now now i'll play the key harder We went up much further, so we basically stretched that envelope curve. So it's a strange old beast. Don't try to be too scientific with the M1. As soon as you figure out what these controls do, just think of everything as relative to everything else. You're never going to be able to plumb in a precise figure here. You're never going to be able to get these pitch envelope generators to do exact specific semitones. That's just not how it works. Everything is very dynamic. Envelope generator time specifies how much faster this pitch modulation is going to get depending on how hard we hit the key. So if I increase some of that as well, now I'll play a light key. And now harder. You can hear that en entire envelope just travels much quicker. This is a little bit unusual about the M1. Normally when you increase envelope times, you actually make the envelope last longer. But in the M1's case, positive modulation on your time actually makes the envelope faster. Not the end of the world, just something you need to know about. I'm just control clicking all of these options to get rid of all my pitch modulation and we're back to a flat sound. Don't forget control click on any option in the Korg. We'll always set it back to whatever its default value is. And as far as the envelope generator is concerned, that's flat. Now, obviously with something like a pitch, modulation, it's possible to end up with comedy sounds and you might think it's not particularly useful. So I thought I'd find an example of a program sound that actually uses uses it for more subtle effect. Program 37, Timpan Bells, let's load that one up. So we've got tubular bells and a sine wave. But can you see this little notch on the sine wave just gives a really brief pitch flick to the sound. And it's almost unnoticeable until you take it away. Control click. You hear that? And you'll very often find this. Lots of programs have very subtle, very quick flicks of the pitch using the pitch envelope generator and it just gives you an extra little bit of colour. Too much and it's becoming a sound effect. Subtle levels is just right. Let's get back to the initialized sound though. 
and I'll go back to my organ again. Now let's have a look at the pitch modulation generator. So this is going to do a very similar kind of thing to what the envelope generator did, but this is a one hit affair. Once the envelope is done, it's done. The modulation generator is going to create a periodic modulation of pitch. Let's enable it because it's disabled by default and the typical waveform is a triangle. So in order to hear this, we need some intensity. So this is how much of the effect, how much pitch modulation we're going to have. And I also need to set a speed of the wave at zero. It's basically infinitely long and you're never really going to hear it. So let's get it up and running. I'll press a key. There's me introducing the pitch intensity. And as I turn intensity up, those pitch variances get deeper and deeper. Let's make it go faster. And now let's try to dial in a usable vibrato. Very small intensity levels. Frequency of three to five hertz usually gets you there. I generally actually prefer, I'd rather that the sine wave was the default position for low frequency oscillators like this. I find sine waves to be the best because it's a perfectly smooth, constantly changing waveform. We can also introduce a delay before that effect comes in. I'll make it very slightly more intense. I do like subtle vibrato, but I'm trying to demo it here. Then I'm going to introduce a delay, which is how long we're going to wait before the vibrato kicks in. So we start out with a static chord and then the vibrato comes in. It's too much now. Let's turn it back down again. Shift click four or five. Seems to be about the sweet spot. Key sync specifies whether or not the modulation is independent for each key. So what I'm going to do to dem demonstrate this is I'll play a chord. I want to get really intense modulation, pretty slow. And then introduce new notes into the chord. See, all three of those notes have basically kind of tied themselves together. They're all following the same modulation curve. Whereas now if I do the same thing and play the chord in a staggered form, an arpeggiated chord. Each one of those notes is following its own modulation curve. It's basically tied to that note. Again, disabled is going to be it's generally your friend because then if there's slight timing differences between you playing the notes. It's going to all even out and use the same modulation generator. That might not be the effect you want. You might want to retain the, the idiosyncrasy of the notes that you played, in which case enable it. That's fine. Tempo sync is all about whether or not it's locked to the um, the host DAW. At the moment, it's freely selectable with this kind of essentially random number. But if we engage tempo sync, now it's going to be locked to the to the host tempo, and we're in fractions or how many times it's repeated per bass note fraction. So let's switch to one quarter, for instance, and we'll start off in times one. We go to times two. We halve the speed of the modulation. Again, more often than not, if I'm using a modulation generator, I'm probably using it for vibrato and I want to maintain complete control of the frequency. It doesn't particularly matter what the tempo of the song is. Vibrato is vibrato, it's its own thing. But again, totally up to you, salt to taste. Let's disable that. 
Now let's have a look at a few extra options that are only useful when we're in double mode. So here's our second oscillator. We've got a piano on oscillator two. I'll leave it at that, that's fine. So there's the piano and organ simultaneously. We can delay the onset of oscillator two. And we can specify an interval offset. So if I set that to seven, for instance, that's gonna be a perfect fifth. just get rid of both of them. My personal favorite of these three options though is detune. Best way to demo this actually is to dial up another organ on oscillator two. So that's the two organ oscillators playing together. Now if I slightly detune them, just hold the shift key down and a very small detune is gonna be fine. you get this unison effect between those two voices, make it more dramatic and it's going to go actually out of tune. Which for organs actually still sounds pretty good. But again, usual rule is if you're playing with detune, less is more. I'm going to switch back to single mode now and jump over to the amplifier. Now a lot of this stuff should start to be looking familiar to you because it's mirroring what's going on in the oscillator screen. Let's have a look at the full amplifier envelope. We've already seen the release um, cycle in play, but a very common thing for you to do is to increase your attack time. And this means it's gonna take longer for the note. It's gonna be gradually introduced every time we press a key. Very common for pad effects. It's not immediately obvious that there is a decay stage here. A nice way to actually find it if one um, symbol is obscuring another is to click these little boxes in the top in the top row. So if I click decay, it highlights the decay node. And now I've got explicit editing control of that one. If I select sustain, now I can control that. So what this basically means is the volume is going to get up to maximum, come down to its decay level over the, the amount of time specified by the decay time. Then we go up to the sustain phase where we spend an amount of time getting there, and that's called slope time. How long do we take to get to the point where nothing else is gonna happen until we let the key go? I'll make this decay really dramatic so it's very obvious what's going on. Up, down. Have I made the slope time too long? Yeah, we can pull it in dynamically and it'll auto adjust. And there's the volume coming back into the sustain level. It's gonna hold at that sustain level now until I let the key go. And then we enter the release cycle. Now we've got a few options for editing the amplitude envelope that take a little bit of wrapping your head around, but you basically need to understand the context of why you would want to manipulate an ADSR envelope to see what's going on over here. Let's start out nice and simply. Envelope generator intensity is all about how much louder does the thing get when you hit the key. Now this is a very, very common effect velocity sensitivity on keyboards is very often something that absolutely you want. So now I'm gonna play a quiet note and then hit the key harder. So now we've introduced some basic velocity sensitivity, all very straightforward so far. The envelope generator time, however, is a different story. If I introduce this, nothing's gonna happen. Quiet note, loud note. I need to tell the synthesizer which of its four stages I want to affect depending on how hard I hit the key. So if I enable positive polarity for the attack phase of the envelope, it means the harder I hit the key, the faster the envelope is going to get to its attack level. I'm going to make this attack time longer to accentuate the effect. So I'll play a quiet note. Okay, it's taking quite a long time to get to that attack level. Now I'll hit that key hard. Just got there straight away. There's, there was basically no attack phase. If I invert the polarity, now the opposite is gonna be true. The quiet note is gonna be the faster one. It was quiet, but it was also quick. And now I'll hit the key hard and it's gonna take ages to get there. Here we come. 
So this intensity has been added onto the attack time. And all the time I'm talking to you, it's going to get louder and louder. And it's going to take ages to get to its maximum level. Because I've set quite a long attack um, envelope generation time here. So these options, they're going to take you a little bit of time to get used to and really figure out what you want. The most common use of envelope generator time is to set it to a bit more of a reasonable level, have a positive polarity on your attack, and then just figure out empirically. If you play a quiet key, generally speaking, you want, want it to come in over a longer period of time. And if you hit into that thing, you want a more dynamic effect. That's generally speaking where you're gonna go, but tons of options to play with there. Keyboard tracking is too much for my stupid brain to handle. I'll give you a quick demo, demo of it, but I, I don't think I've ever used this. Basically, you use like a seesaw effect to specify whether or not the pitch of the note that you play is going to have an overall effect on the envelope. So I've set myself up quite a long attack time here with nothing else interesting going on on the envelope. So with everything being flat, this is how long the envelope takes to get to its maximum amplitude. So I'm going to specify a time offset. How big do I want the discrepancy to be? I'm going to specify my center key. Let's say C3, it's as good as anything. And then I'm going to specify what polarity I'm interested in. So this is the attack phase that we're going to be affecting. Now here's the lowest note on the keyboard. It's going to take longer to get there. That attack phase is now longer. See, it's going to take quite a while to get to the maximum. In fact, I'm bored. Let's play the top note. We get there much faster. Kind of reasonable. I shouldn't rag on it. I just, there's only so much I can handle when I'm configuring these sounds. And that's basically usually a step too far for me. In the middle of the screen, we have basically tremolo. So this is an amplifier modulation generator. We'll be able to periodically vary the amplitude and tremolo is the most uh, common effect you're going to want to get from this. So again, fairly gentle tremolo. Let's see what we can get if I turn it on. There we go. And again, introduce a delay to make it sound more natural. So that's a flat sound, and then the tremolo kicks in. That's all for today. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Please hit like if you did. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. It helps me out with the YouTube stuff. I'll see you next time. Thanks very much.